I want to welcome every one of us uh, once again to Believe Us Hang Out tonight. As always, uh, it's always awesome to see every one of us. And I just pray as we have come, the Lord will give us an unforgettable encounter in his presence in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, as always, you know, I just want to encourage us again. Every time we come together like this, we have very short you know, moments to spend in this place. But let's do our best to make it count. You know, let's make it count. Let's pay rapt attention so that the Lord, you know, can work expressly in us. And so that all that the Lord is trying to communicate to us um, so that it will not elude us. And I pray tonight the Lord will truly send his word to us and it will bring us healing in every aspect of our lives in the name of Jesus. Um, so like I said, last week we started a series um, on a topic that you know, I consider to be very, very important, especially if um, the idea of um, um, fulfilling purpose and fulfilling your calling, if that is something that is important to you, then this is a, a an understanding, a revelation that every single one of us must have. You know, um, God didn't put us here just so that we can mark time and just um, follow the rat race like everybody else. There is a very, very definite intention, you know, um, in the heart of God when he created you. There is something very specific that God wanted you to accomplish in time. And it is your degree of alignment in fulfilling all that the Lord has planned for you, has written concerning you. It is your degree of sticking to that script that determines the level of reward that you actually get when you do get to heaven. Like I said last week, um, the our decision to accept Jesus as our Lord only opens the gates of heaven to us. So the, the, the basis of our entrance into heaven is our decision to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus said, I am the door. No man can go to the Father except by me. So he is the only door to the Father. So by accepting him as our Lord, what happens to us is that we become embedded in him because the truth of the matter is the only person who has a stature to, um, and this, this is not my teaching tonight, um, but you know, when, when we talk about the concept of the eternal judgment, you know, there are several kinds of judgment, but the principal judgment that everybody every human being who has ever lived we go through is the great wife throne judgment okay there are there are other judgments you know the 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 bema say the marriage supper of the lamb you know where the saints will be rewarded and all of that but the main judgment that everyone will pass through is the great white throne judgment. And the truth of the matter is there is nobody on earth in himself who has the capacity to go through that judgment and be uncondemned. That's just the truth because the Bible makes us to understand that even our righteousness is as a field of rag before the Lord. So even in the, even the best of us, even in our best states, in ourselves, we do not have the capacity to attain the righteousness of God. And that is the reason why even when Jesus died and he went to Hades, the first thing he did was to preach to the saints who had died and who were, who were kind of being, they, they were not being held technically because they were in a good part of Hades, they were in Abraham's bosom, so they were in a place of rest, but they could not, um, they could not be partakers of all, all that was possible in the grand plan of God. They could not, they were not in heaven, the saints that passed you know, in the Old Testament, they didn't go to heaven. They were they were down below. They were on the other part of hell. That's why when you listen to the account of Jesus, you know, when he was talking about um, the 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 concept of um, the story of the um, Lazarus and the rich rich man, the rich fool, you know, he he made a statement and it was describing something that actually happened at a particular point in time. And he was talking about how that the rich man, you know, was tormented and frustrated, and he was saying to Lazarus on the other side, you know, he was in Abraham's bosom and he was saying, let him dip his finger into the water and come and cool my tongue and all of that. And Abraham made a statement. He said, it's impossible for him to pass from here to you because between you and us, there is a great divide. There is a great wall. There is a great breach. That's telling us that they were in the same location. The only difference was that there was a separation. There was a divide that prevented trespass. You know, people could not cross from one side to the other. So all the saints that died in the old covenant, they didn't go to heaven. They were in, in Abraham's bosom, although they were not in, in a place of torment, but they were in a good place. But the point I'm making is that after the resurrection, um, after the death of Christ, when he went down to Hades, one of the first things he did was that he preached to those saints 
you know, and when he did, those that believed, the Bible made us understand that they came out with Jesus out of Hades. And some of them actually walked literally on earth on the streets of Jerusalem before they ascended to heaven, you know. And the point I'm just making here is that all saints, whether Old or New Testament saints, must be embedded in Jesus before they can pass through the white throne judgment. Okay, so when Jesus appears in front of the Father during the white throne judgment, he won't be the only one appearing. He will be in, in Jesus. You will be in Jesus. I will be in Jesus. Abraham will be in Jesus. Every saint that has ever lived will be in Jesus. So Jesus, like a container, you know, it's just like when you are carrying a bag of groceries. You may be carrying only one bag, but inside that one bag, there can be 20 groceries. So that's how we will be embedded in Jesus to be able to pass through the white, great white throne judgment. And when we now pass through, through together with Jesus to the judgment, then Jesus himself will now judge those of us who are in him he will now give us rewards on the basis of our faithfulness in accomplishing the assignment that he has for us. And that is that is where this topic really becomes important. So we are going beyond the idea. This is not about you making heaven or not making heaven. Whether you fulfill your purpose on it or not, or not as long as you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will make heaven. Okay, so but the goal of this teaching is to make sure that we become rewarded in heaven that will not just go to heaven and then we'll be biting our fingers, wishing we had done things differently in time. Because the moment time is over, there is no redo. <laughs> it is only by the mercy of God once in a while that people can come back from the dead. And that is when somebody else decides as an act of their will to bring them back. You know, what if there's nobody to bring you back when you die? Even if they do, what if you die at the age of 80? Or 85, and your lifespan was maybe 90, and they bring you back at 85. <laughs> there is not still not much you can do anymore. But the point I'm making is just that while we are here in time, time is an opportunity for us to invest in heaven. Time is an opportunity for us to invest in eternity because eternity is time without end. Just think about that. And the moment you die, you have no you can't influence your script anymore. You know, it's just like a student taking an exam and they tell you, you have three hours to write this exam. Within the course of that three hours, a student can decide to cross his or her legs, you know, and chew gum and, you know, scroll through Facebook, you know, and watch TikTok videos, you know, and then five minutes to the end, he realizes he's in an exam and then he decides to scribble something down. And at the end of the day, the moment he turns in that script, the time is up. The grade that he will get for his contribution in that exam is based on the work that he put in into that exam script. Now, was that all he could do? Maybe not. Was that the, is that score necessarily a reflection of his or her intelligence? Maybe not. But the point of the matter is, when it comes to the point of action, all that he will be rewarded on is based on what he did or did not do. And that is how it is also when it comes to the comparison of time and eternity. So your script will be marked based on what you did in time. So, and this is something that when you think about it, it really should get you worried, you know, because if you are 20 years old now, maybe 25 years old, and maybe in God's calendar, you're supposed to live for 70 years, you're supposed to live for 80 years. Now, you're already 25 years old, you're going to live for 75 years, you have 50 years left as part of your time on earth. Now, out of that 50 years, let's say you sleep for eight hours every day. That means automatically one third of that remaining 50 years is going to be spent sleeping. All right. So out of that 50 years, if you think about it, the, all the productive time that is actually left, may not even be up to 30 years, you know. And if you think about all the different activities of life, legitimate activities of life that will take your time, that, that even have nothing to do with your purpose, there is a lot of them. You know, so how much time do you really have left to pursue the purpose of God if you continue living in this trajectory. If just ask yourself that question, if I continue living the way I'm living now and I continue like that for the next 50 years, will I, at the end of my, my day, will I be able to look back and say, yes, I gave my best? Or will I look back and bite my fingers and say, I wish I could have done more? If the decisions you are making now are not leading you to fulfilling purpose, then now is the time to recalibrate. Now is the time to adjust your step. Now is the time to begin to make new decisions so that you can, at the end of the day, 20, 30, 50, 50 
you know, years from now, whatever the time might be, whether by death or by rapture, you are, at the end of the day, when it comes to time to meet the Lord, like Apostle Paul, you'll be able to say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. And I pray for every one of us that that will be our testimony in the name of Jesus. So last week we looked at the stages of our race. And I did say last week that there are three main phases or stages that every one of us must pass through in this race, you know, of fulfilling what God has called you to do. And by the way, I said last week that our race that we are called to run is simply what God has called us to do. So your race, in another word, can be can also be called your purpose. It can also be called your destiny. It can be called your calling, the assignment that God has given to you, the thing that God has written about you as the reason for your existence. That is your race. And I did say last week also that our race is unique. To every one of us is custom made is the obstacle course is custom made the, no two people have the same race so you can't compete with me and i can't compete with you even if god has called us to do something similar it's important for us to compete because our assignments are different we are each on our own course and god will judge you on the base so in reality you are competing against yourself in destiny you are not really competing against someone else you are competing against yourself you are you're, you're, you will be judged based on the standard of what God has written concerning you. And that is the reason why if you are succeeding, I have no reason to be jealous of you. Rather, I should be motivated by your success that if my brother can make it, if my brother who I knew where he's coming from, who I knew was weak, who I knew was limited, if he could eventually become this, then it also means I also can become it. But the mistakes that many unwise people make is that when they see believers who are succeeding, who God is using, who, who, who are able to accomplish their purpose, uh, who, who are just succeeding generally. The first reaction they have is jealousy, you know, or intimidation. They feel like, why is this person, you know, succeeding better than me? And the reason why people think like that is because they do not understand that our race is unique, it's custom made. You are not in competition. Even if you are, you are twins, your destinies, it, it can be like light and day. The fact that you are twins does not mean that there is any relationship in your destiny whatsoever because God gave every one of us custom-made assignments. So the fact that your brother is succeeding does not make you less. The fact that your sister is succeeding does not in any way affect you. You should rejoice with them and then draw motivation from them and trust God for grace to accomplish your own purpose and accomplish your own assignment because at the end of the day, you will be judged based on you and you alone. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. But like I said last week, there were three things, uh, three stages of the race we discussed last week. The first phase is to discover your race or your calling. If you have not even discovered what God has called you to do, then your chances of accomplishing or fulfilling it is actually zero. You know, it's just like a, 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 a wrestler, you know, who, who has no idea who his opponent is, who has no idea he's even going to <laughs> going to go to war, you know, and then one day he just woke up, woke up in the morning at 4 a.m. And then his alarm rings, and then they tell you, "Oh, your 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 match is ready." And he says, "What match? Ah, you have you have a, a a battle to fight tonight, you know, for maybe the heavyweight title of the world and all of that." And then he wakes up and expects he will jump into the ring and just win. It doesn't work like that anywhere. All right, you have to be first of all know that there is there is a battle ahead. It is the knowledge of that battle that actually gives you the 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 wisdom to be able to prepare. For that battle so the first stage of our race is to discover our calling and i said last week that if you have not discovered your calling go to god ask god to reveal it to you and also pay attention to the gifts and the talents that the lord has given you the passions that that burn within you naturally and take them to the lord the holy spirit is ultimately the person who can reveal your purpose and your assignment to you but you know like i said there are many other pointers that can give you that can you know give you an idea for example when you see somebody doing something that god has called you to do one of the reactions that happens to you instantly is that you know something jumps within you that no that should be me or that that can be me you know you will know there are many ways but the ultimate way to know is ask god to reveal it to you and by all means the holy spirit will reveal it to you and then the second stage of our race is to keep our calling the first step is to discover it the second stage is to keep it and i did explain last week that the fact that god has called you does not mean god will eventually choose you to actually accomplish that assignment because the bible says many are called but few are chosen and the reason many the reason few are chosen is not because god wants to choose few it is because it is few people that will pay the price to become who they need to be in order to be able to fulfill the assignment. Because you have to understand that um, this version of you may not have what it takes to fulfill the calling that God has given to you. 
for example, if God has given you a, a, a calling around money, okay, maybe managing money or, you know, and all of that, and you are naturally a greedy person, you are naturally a stingy person, you are naturally a, a thief, <laughs> the truth of the matter is God cannot trust you with the amount of money your destiny requires as long as that weakness is there. So part of your training will be to get rid of all of those limitations so that you can be competent and better equipped in order to be able to handle the things that God is bringing your way. Okay, so, but your own um, seriousness and commitment to doing the things, the exercises God says you should do in order to become that version of yourself that can fulfill that calling, your own commitment to doing that is what will now enable you to keep your calling to the point where you can be chosen to actually fulfill that assignment that the mantle of your destiny actually rests on you and God commissions you and sends you to accomplish that assignment. And then the third stage of our race is to fulfill our calling. So as we continue in that consistency in doing the things that make for your competency in the purpose that God has called you to do, as you continue in that process, then what we at the, 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 at the end of the day, the result will be that you fulfilled your calling. And I pray for every one of us that that will be our experience at the end of time in Jesus' name. Now, today we are going to the second part of the teaching. And um, I'm pretty sure we cannot finish this this week. But by God's grace, we'll, wherever we stop, we'll continue from there next week. Can we all hear me? The second part of Uh, yes. I can hear you, but it's okay. like it's um it's replaying like okay. but it has stopped on. now. It has stopped now. It has stopped. Okay, hold on, please. Can you hear me? I hope the feedback is gone now. Yes. Okay. 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 Awesome. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So like I said, uh, today we are going to the part two of our teaching. And today we are going to be looking at the keys that can actually help us to win our races. So again, the subtitle today is the keys to winning our race. And the first key we are going to be looking at is to realize that we are in a race. So the first thing that you must do and the first step you must take, the first weapon you must have in your arsenal is that you must realize that you are in a race. You must realize that you are in a race. Let's look at the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. It's a very popular scripture. Hebrews chapter 12. And to read that from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. It says, wherefore, seeing also that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let me read this from NLT for better understanding. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with patience and with endurance the race that God has set before us. Let's also look at First Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse twenty-four. He says, "Don't you realize that in every race, that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize?" He says, "So run to win. Run to win." So the central theme. But the main point, one of the main points being communicated in both scriptures that I've read here is the fact that we must come to that state of mind where we first of all become aware that we are in a race. There are other things that we must now begin to do because we are aware that we are in a race. But the first thing that must become crystal clear to us is that we are in a race. 
Okay, and I know this sounds simple, but the truth is, many people do not know that they are in a race. They do not know that there is a timing component to the destiny and the assignment that God has given them. And I, and I explained that last week, that the fact that God has called you does not mean that God will choose you. God will give you an ample time, ample window of obedience, you know, such that, you know, at the end of the day, when you do decide to become serious and to take your calling and your assignment seriously, God can still put you on a fast track that will help you to grow and become the person that can handle the assignment that God has called you to do. But if you make up your mind that you are not even interested in that assignment, you're not even interested in that purpose, you're not even interested in that calling, you just want to make money <laughs> and live a luxurious life and die, well, um, you may still make heaven as long as your relationship with God is intact, but as far as reward goes, you will receive next, next to no reward in eternity, you know? But the point I'm just making here is that if you are going to even begin to put in, because make no mistakes about it, if you will run to win, and that is what Apostle Paul was explaining in that 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he says, if you are going to, be, to run at all, it's better to run and to win and to just run for the fun of it. That's what he was explaining. That many people run in a race, but in human scale, only one person gets the prize. And what that means is that it is that one person that got the prize that did all that, put in their best and prepared the best and executed the race the best. That's what it means. Okay, and I've already explained that we are not in competition with anybody, but if you are going to run and you will cross the finish line and win the prize, which means you fulfill all that God has called you to do, then there is a measure of seriousness and preparedness and discipline and training and activity that has to go into it before you even become that version of yourself that can perform at that level. Okay? But the first key is to realize that you are in a race. There are many believers today who do not even know why they are alive. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about people who have not discovered their purpose. I mean, sometimes people have even known from very young age you know that this is you know i think i should be a preacher but they've not become aware that this is, this is something serious it, it has not occurred to them that the concept of purpose and destiny is all important so they still live as though they are the they, 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 there is no goal in mind they still live as though there is no destiny to fulfill they still live as though there is no race to run because you have to understand, the fact that you know something in your head does not, the knowledge you have in your head does not necessarily bless you until that knowledge influences your action. So if you just know something mentally, so the person who does not know their purpose at all is just in, in, in as bad a state as somebody who knows it mentally but has not made any effort to pursue a time. They are in the same level. And at the end of the day, when the owner of the vineyard comes, like we read last week, both of them will be uprooted if they continue not to bear fruit over time. And the fact that they are uprooted does not mean they will die. They will still be alive. But <laughs> the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. You know, the Bible says in a great house, there are all kinds of vessels. There are vessels unto honor and there are vessels unto dishonor. And everybody has a use. If you live and you fulfill your purpose in Christ, God will have a use for you. He will use you as a vessel to honor. In other words, he will use you as an example of um, what a, a person who fulfills God's purpose looks like. And in the same way, if you decide to, you know, to disregard the purpose of God and you decide not to fulfill the purpose of God, God will still have a use for you. Of course, if you repent down the line, even after God has given your purpose to someone else, God will still find something else for you to do. That's what the Bible makes us to understand in Jeremiah chapter 18. The parable of the potter, that even when the original design is broken, the potter can make it again into another vessel. So you may not be able to do the original assignment God has called you to do, but God can still give you something good to do, okay? But the worst state is the person who completely just decides to go against God, absolutely. And what God does with people like that is an example of what not to do, okay? Those are vessels unto dishonor. Their life will be a tale of what not to do as someone that God has called, you know? And I just pray that God will not use us as vessels unto dishonor in the name of Jesus. But we must, the first realization we must come to is the fact that we are in a race. And that knowledge and that awareness, you know, it's just like someone who wants to write an exam. He knows he has an exam and he has two months to prepare for the exam. And I'm sure for many of us who are students here, we can relate to this, you know. And he says, oh, I'm going to study, I'm going to prepare. And then 
one week goes by, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, you know, until it becomes two weeks to the exam. Then he says, oh, I think I should start studying now. But <laughs> somehow he has no plan behind the study. He just says, I'm going to start studying now. And before you know it, he couldn't study. One week to the exam, five days to the exam, four, three. And then when it now becomes two days to the exam, then an alarm goes off. <laughs> and then it suddenly becomes aware. And then he now begins to study. You see, the moment, the day he begins to study, as though he has an exam, that's the day he actually realized he had an exam. So the fact that you have mental knowledge of something does not mean you have come to a compelling awareness of that reality. So what I'm saying here about realizing you are in a race is to come to that point that you know I am two days to the exam. I have a purpose to fulfill and I cannot afford to fail. And because of that awareness, you now begin to do something that will enable you to pass that exam. That is what it means to realize, to become aware that you are in a race. And I pray the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. The second key to winning our race is to eliminate distractions. Eliminate distractions. Let's look at the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. I read from Amplified. It says, no soldier in active service gets entangled in the ordinary business affairs of civilian life. He says he avoids them so that he may please the one who enlisted him to serve. And you see, this is the mindset and the mentality that we must have as believers who will fulfill the assignment that God has given us. Let's look at the book of Hebrews also. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We have read this before, but let's read it again. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slow us down and every sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with patience and endurance the race that God has set before us. You see, the moment you become aware that you are in a race and you begin to start doing something, you start doing something, you know, to prepare you for winning that race. The next thing Satan will throw at you are distraction, distractions. Now, distractions can come in the form of sins, outright sins, or can come in the form of seemingly harmless or legitimate activities, but that ultimately reduce your efficiency in fulfilling the assignments that God has for you. Okay? And it can be anything. It can be something as simple as, as um, video games. Okay? Now, a video game in itself, playing video games in itself, of course, depending on the kind of the game. <laughs> Technically, playing a video game in itself is not a sin. There is nothing sinful about it, okay? It's just recreation, okay? But when that video game now becomes elevated and exalted in the priority of your life, to the point that it becomes more important than the thing that God has called you to do, then that video game has become a weight that is slowing you down. And what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 is that you cut off the weight. Let it go. You see, what one way I like to think about this is this. When I'm when there's something to do, and I'm thinking about the pleasure, you know, or the gratification that I can receive from it. I now compare that to the consequences that I will face if I do not pursue the thing that is more important, you know. When I now weigh those things side by side, okay, how would I feel if I have this momentary gratification and pleasure and at the end of the day six days from now one month from now i you know maybe fail this particular exam or miss this particular opportunity how bad will i feel do i want to feel that bad is it worth it to feel good for a little bit now and to feel bad you know so bad one month from now and if the answer is no then automatically that activity must go okay and this is the mentality that we must have. Anything that does not add to you. And we, we need to take stock of our lives and take inventory. What are the things that are actually important in my life? What are the things that are actually necessary in my life? Because the truth, especially in this world of social media, you know, when people are getting addicted to attention, you know, and just being noticed online and likes and clicks and follows and all of that. We must sit down and take a breather and ask ourselves, what are the things that are really important in my life? There are people who can spend 10 hours a day on TikTok. And I'm not talking of 
people use it for their business or promotions and all of that. No, I mean, just watching random videos, you know, just posting random videos. That has absolutely no bearing on their purpose and their calling and their assignment, you know, and they are just there for, for sometimes all day. And the whole day just goes like that. And, you know, time is just burnt. And then the justification you give yourself is, oh, it's just one day, you know, I'll, I'll catch up tomorrow. And then, unfortunately, tomorrow comes and you do the same thing. And you say, well, it's just one day, I'll catch up tomorrow. You know what? If you continue on that trajectory 30 years from now, you will look back and say, oh, wow, I wish I did things differently. Because the truth is, there, there are some, some, um, some weaknesses we allow in our life. And we think, oh, it's not a big deal. When I grow older, you know, I will outgrow them. You see, for example, something as simple as laziness or indiscipline. You may think that, oh, it's because I'm just, you know, I'm still in my early 20s. You know, once I become 30 years old, you know, I'll, I'll become more mature and all of that. The truth of the matter is, if you don't deal with some of these things early, you will be 50 years old, you will be 60 years old. You will still be suffering from the same weaknesses that you were suffering from at the age of 15. And that is because Satan doesn't want his captives to go free. This is, this is, there are no such things as harmless weaknesses. They don't exist. Any weakness must be dealt with. Because if it is not dealt with, it will limit you from fulfilling the assignment God has had for you. Even if you are still able to move, you won't be able to move at maximum capacity to slow you down. So any habits you have, any, any hobbies you have, that you, you now look at them. What is the correlation between this hobby that I have, that I love, and my assignment, my purpose, my destiny. Does this thing hurt to me? Does it improve me? Does it, does it help me get better? And if the answer is no, then those things must go and they must go early so that you will be strong and you will be efficient in running the race. You don't want to be running a sprint, having a backpack strapped to your back, loaded with weights. It will only slow you down. Even if you have the potential to be the to, to, to run the fastest, the moment you add weights to yourself, you can take the last position. Because the slowest runner on the pitch without a weight can become faster than you because you refuse to let go of unnecessary distractions. So whatever has constituted the distraction to you, you know, preventing you from pursuing the things that really matter in God's agenda, a time has come for us to take that step, get a pen, get a paper, and list out those things. And then highlight practical steps, things you will begin to do differently by the help of God to get rid of those things. It's not just about knowing it in there and say, oh, I will change this, I will change that. Write it down, document it, find scriptures to support it, place it around your house so that you can constantly be reminded. But I would say write the vision, make it plain upon tables that it may run, that reads it. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So the first key is to realize you're in a race. The second key is to eliminate distractions. The third key is to accept the culture of discipline and diligence. Accept the culture of discipline and diligence. First Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. I want us to read there from verse 25 and 27. I read from NLT. He says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. Verse 27. He says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. And unfortunately, many people have become disqualified from the race of destiny. Why? Because they did not accept the culture of diligence. They did not accept the culture of discipline. I want us to just think about it. I don't know about you, but I personally, you know, I like to follow athletes, you know, follow their training regimens, you know, their, their stories, you know, why they became so great and all of that. And one factor that I've found consistently across every great athlete I've ever followed is the fact that they are disciplined and they are diligent and they are unemotional about their dedication to their training. In fact, some athletes will tell you, I hate working out. I hate going to the gym. But I know if I don't, I cannot become the world champion. So I go every day. I do the exercises I hate the most so that I can become the world champion. Because they... they, they, they they know that without a culture of discipline and unemotional diligence, they know that the chances of them achieving their goals, becoming the people they desire to be, the chances are next to zero. And this is something also we must understand, that indiscipline is not a harmless weakness. 
Laziness is not a harmless weakness. No, it can literally break your destiny. Literally. Because make no mistakes about it. If God has called you to something spiritual, maybe to preach or to maybe be a worship minister or any of those things, there are consecrations that you must keep that will enable the anointing to flow through you consistently, that will enable you to be competent and well-positioned to be able to dispense that assignment. For example, if you are going to be a prophetic minister, one of the consecrations you must abide by is consistent prayer. And I'm not just talking of one hour of prayer per day. I'm talking of long stretches of prayer on a consistent basis. That takes discipline. Fasting on a consistent basis. There is no such, there is no anointing for fasting. There is no um, gift of fasting in the Bible. Fasting is all about discipline and diligence that is supported by the grace of God. So if there is no culture of discipline, if there is no culture of diligence, whether you are called to ministry, you know, in terms of the fivefold ministry, whether you are called to business, whether you are called to politics, whether you are called to athletics or whatever, whatever your calling or your assignment may be, you cannot accomplish it if there is no discipline and if there is no diligence. And it doesn't matter what level you may be right now. If you decide today that you begin to do things differently, the few questions you can ask yourself is, what is the one thing? Yes, I may not be able to change everything overnight. I may not be able to turn everything around overnight. But what is the one thing I can begin to do differently today that will make me more disciplined? What is the one thing I can begin to do differently today that will make me more diligent? What is the one activity I can begin to do today that will help me, that will boost the culture of discipline and diligence in my life? And we must take, sit down, and you see, this is something that requires us sitting down and thinking. And unfortunately for many of us who are lost in the world of social media, you never even have the opportunity to sit, sit down and think about your life. If I were to take a census right now, and I ask some of us, and say, when was the last time you actually sat down to think and to plan about your life? For many of us, the answer may be years ago. Why? Because Satan has, has filled us with so many distractions that has killed discipline in our life. So you wake up in the morning, there is, there is a video waiting for you on, on, on YouTube. You wake up in the afternoon, there is a video waiting for you on TikTok. There is a, there is a chat. There, is a, there are all kinds of things that are just constantly taking our attention. And our attention span has become so short. We do not have the time to even sit down and actually take one hour to think and plan about our life and our destiny. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So if that's even the first step you will take, to shut down from all the distractions and just take an hour to actually sit down. How is my life going? This, I'm not talking about self-condemnation. I'm talking about self-assessment. How has my life been? What are the things that I know God has spoken concerning me? How much of them have I accomplished? What steps am I taking to accomplish them? On the scale of 1 to 100, how far along am I on the, in, in terms of fulfilling the assignment or being ready to fulfill the assignment God has called me to do? Do I like the way my life is going right now? If I continue on this path, 10, 20, 50 years from now, will I look back and regret or will I look back and rejoice? The choices I'm making right now, will they take me towards the fulfillment of my assignment or will it take me far away from there? Take an hour to sit down and meditate and think and plan and write down things and set goals that you can actually achieve, not unreasonable goals. Goals. Okay, from today, I will begin to pray for 20 hours a day. It's unrealistic. If you are somebody who, are, who, has, who has been struggling to even pray for 30 minutes a day, you won't just wake up and begin to pray 20 hours a day. It's unrealistic. So set reasonable and realistic goals. Okay, I've been praying for 30 minutes before. I know that I need more prayer in order to be more equipped to fulfill my purpose. So I will increase the prayer from 30 minutes to one hour every day. And I will make sure that no matter what happens, whether I'm sick, whether I'm healthy, whether I'm hungry, whether I'm thirsty, whether I'm full, no matter what is happening or not happening, every single day there will be an offering of one hour of prayer going to the Lord. You see, that is now a step that will take you towards building the culture of discipline and diligence. And I just pray that the Lord will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And the fourth key as we go to the Lord in prayer is to master consistency. Master consistency. Like I said earlier, one of the things that characterizes athletes is consistency in their training. Consistency in their training. If you are not consistent in your training, it doesn't matter how disciplined or how diligent you are occasionally, you will still not be equipped. You will not be in a shape 
where you can you can perform at your optimal position. You know, you find athletes. If you ever found an athlete who, who works out once a month, then you know that an athlete who is never going to become the world champion. Because if you're going to become a world champion, there has to be a consistent measure of rigorous activity you subject your body to on a consistent basis. In fact, you speak to most athletes, they will tell you consistency is more important than diligence or discipline in the overall scheme of things. Because if you're only diligent occasionally, like the student who studies two days to the exam, is diligent. That's the fact. A person who can take two all-nighters because of an exam is diligent in that moment. But the problem is that the diligence is not consistent. And because of that inconsistently in, inconsistency in diligence, it will still be limited in terms of fulfilling the assignment that God has for him or her. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I will not read it, but let's just write down Luke chapter 18, verse 4 and 5. This is the story of the widow that was troubling the judge. You know, the Bible says, did not fear God and did not fear man. But because of her consistency in coming and asking him to fight for her, even though the guy, you know, he, he did not fear God, he did not care about what people had to say, but because of her consistency in coming, at the end of the day, he had to give her, you know, what she needed. In the same way, if you are consistent enough in pursuing your purpose and destiny, you will eventually achieve it. You will eventually get there and you eventually become everything that God has called you to be. Just the same way, if you enter you know, and address into your GPS and it says eight hours and you continue consistently on that path. In the next eight hours, you will get to your destination because of consistency. If you decide to take one hour break after every one hour, then your journey will be multiplied from eight hours to 16 hours. So what we allow you to get to your destination on time is consistency in doing the things that will take you in the direction of your destiny. I pray the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Let's stop there for tonight because of time. Can we just go to Lord's Prayer? Just talk to the Lord in the next few seconds and say, Lord, help me. Thank you for your word that has come to me tonight. Father, give me grace. Give me grace in the name of Jesus. I don't know what your own issue is, but the Lord has spoken to you tonight. Can you just go to the Lord in prayer and take that issue to the Lord? Maybe your own is that you have not even discovered that you are in a race. You are still living as though there is no assignment to fulfill. As if there is no purpose, there is no, there is no destiny to seize. Can you pray and say, Lord, open my eyes. Help me. I want to become aware of my destiny. I want to become aware of my race. I want to become aware of my calling. And I want to, I, I, I want a, 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 a gripping consciousness of my calling, of my destiny, of my purpose to come upon my life. Father, open my eyes and let me see. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I'm ready to eliminate distraction. Maybe your only distractions. You know what God has called you to do, but you just can't bring yourself to doing it. Father, every form of distraction in my life, give me the grace to get rid of them. It's your responsibility. God will not do it for you. It's your responsibility to eliminate distraction. God can only give you the grace that will help you to do it. Can you ask God to help you to eliminate distraction, to accept the culture of diligence and to master consistency in the name of Jesus. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Before we go tonight, I'd like to give opportunity to anyone who, loves to, who wants to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You see, you cannot even, any of these kids cannot really bless you until you have entered the race by accepting Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. So if you are there tonight and you want to make this decision for the Lord, can you just place your hand on your chest and just say this prayer after me for many from the depth of your heart. Just tell him, Lord Jesus, I recognize myself as a sinner and I know I cannot save myself. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Come into my heart. Become my Lord and my Savior. From this day, I declare that I will live for you and you alone. Give me the grace to go and to sin no more. Thank you, Jesus, because you have saved me. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your word that's come to us. I pray for those who have decided to accept you as Lord and Savior. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you wash their sins away and you give them the grace to go and to sin no more in the name of Jesus. And I pray for every one of us who got the grace to do all that is our responsibility to do, to engage all the keys you have released to us tonight so that we can begin to follow the path that will take us ultimately to the fulfillment of our calling, of our destiny, and to win the race that is set before us. Father, I pray you release into our lives in the name of Jesus. As we go into this week, help us to practice this thing in the name of Jesus. And by the time we we'll come together next week, help us to be better versions of ourselves in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed.